I will open without uh, get a sleep after your uh, lunch. My name is Moti Cohen, and I would like to present Aceptoray, an eco-friendly pasteurization technology. Actually, pasteurization has started in 1864 by Louis Pasteur, and haven't been changed so far as so much since then. But we don't have to go so far away. This was the news headlines in Israel in the last summer, and microbial problems and microbial issues goes with the food industry all the way from 1864 to today. What we are doing is basically new pasteurization technology, meaning we offer new technology that gets safer products, superior microbial results, and saves energy at the same time. But let's start from the beginning. I know it's an agriculture event. What is pasteurization? Pasteurization basically is treating treatments throughout heat in order to ensure food safety. It works, but it has some major disadvantages. It costs a lot of money, and it degrades the nutrients, and it do one more thing which basically changes the taste. None of you, I assume, boils his orange juice before he's drinking it. Now, there are other alternatives, and we are not alone, and we are using UV, and UV has been in, around for uh, about 80 years, and it's works great, you know, no chemicals, no energy, uh, energy efficient, but UV is basically a light, and when there's no light, it cannot penetrate and therefore cannot work in turbid liquids. Our solution is exactly that. It's UV disinfection of all liquids regardless of their turbidity, meaning we can treat all kinds of liquids. And your next question would be, how do we do it? So behind the mathematical algorithms and fluid dynamics and all this, it's very simple. We are mixing the product. This is exactly what we are doing. We are ensuring the UV dose will be sufficient in order to eliminate bacteria. We can do it with a variety of products. It uh, depends on capacities that work on production line. Now, I know when I'm saying pasteurization, most, most of you would think about milk, but actually every bottled juice or beverage that has been uh, bottled has to be mandatory, has to be pasteurized. We're talking about 117 billion gallons per year. We are focusing in the, in the beverage and, and juice and beverage market. And I said that we, we are doing a superior microbial results, meaning we can eliminate the problematic bacteria, the pathogenic, the spores, in a variety of products, regardless of the sensitivity and, uh, and, and the turbidity. I mentioned cost, you know, uh, some uh, minor uh, issue. If you're looking at thermal pasteurization, we're talking about 1.4 cents per gallon. That is the standard cost of pasteurization. Our system cost is around 0.34 gallon per, per uh, uh, cent per gallon. If you compare to alternative, because there are always alternatives, we are talking about huge amount of money savings throughout our technology. Now, uh, as many of you know, we are not in the uh, cyber and application, meaning in order to have sales, it's a long process. Our process means you don't get an app and download it like you vote here. You have to talk to the companies, you have to show what you are doing, and we are doing it uh, all around the world with some uh, small companies like, com uh, like PepsiCo and some bigger companies like Greenhouse, which is two person uh, uh, in, in Canada. Um, we are here because we are in a state that we said, okay, our technology is proven, we think it works, there are some indication in the pilot uh, that I just mentioned before that the system works. So we want to go to the next stage, and the next stage will be to get the approval, to get the round A, to get the approval, and, and uh, uh, start sales, actually. Start actual sales, not just pilots and uh, tests, uh, and to have a subsidiary or a U.S. activity in the U.S. And when saying we, I should emphasize, we are talking about the concepts that came from the industry, it's something that the need or the, or the problem was uh, coming from an already 47 years old established uh, factory. And just a final note, I, I mentioned what we are doing here and there was a change in my slide just in the last few days. We had our first sale to a Japanese company uh, just a few days ago. And I should mention that we have now our second sale uh, uh, signed yesterday uh, for the Canadian com uh, company. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, since you're working in the beverage and juice industry, um, are there going to be regulatory obstacles in the U.S. that you're going to face? Uh, 
thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, there are always regulatory um, in, in what we are doing, and there is your regulatory approval for UV treatment of, of beverage. Uh, I, I, I explain it in a way that I, I'm coming from the medical field where you have PMA, 510K, or exempt product. We are basically exempt product in a way, meaning the UV is approved to be used in the US and in Canada to treat juice and beverages. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Lenore Shoham, CEO of Inplant. As a company that started just five months ago, I'm grateful for the opportunity to present Inplant today. Inplant's technology is intended to improve the efficiency of agrochemicals, ultimately allowing the farmer to use less chemicals to grow more food. To understand what we do, think about the nicotine patch. The patch is applied in the skin, but that's not where the nicotine acts. To be effective, the nicotine needs to penetrate through the skin into the circulation, which carries the drug through the body to its target site in the brain. The challenge is to get enough of the product to move from where we apply it to where it needs to act. The same challenge exists when we spray agrochemicals and fertilizers on the foliage of plants. So when we spray this plant, the plant, the spray partially covers the leaves, but that's not necessarily the action site. Often we need the agrochemical to reach all parts of the plant. For that to happen, it needs to penetrate into the leaf and into the plant's transport systems to be dispersed. The problem that Inplant addresses is that many agrochemicals actually don't move well in the plant. And by that I mean not only some of the important pesticides, but some micronutrients and biostimulants as well. So this experiment from the literature demonstrates the immobility of iron. Sugar beets and peach trees were grown under iron deficient conditions until the leaves turned yellow. An iron formulation was applied in half of each leaf on the tree, but weeks later, only the treated parts of the leaves show recovery and turn green. The iron simply doesn't move anywhere else. That's actually why, despite the convenience, iron is never applied as a foliar spray. A similar example is the herbicide, which kills only those parts of the leaves that come into direct contact with the spray. Now, the obvious solution is to spray more and try to cover the leaves completely. And that's what the farmers do. But that's wasteful, it's bad for the environment, and also it's not always good enough. Some of the worst weeds have underground organs that allow them to regenerate. So that even if the herbicide kills the foliage completely, if it doesn't move underground, we don't get good enough weed control. So ultimately, agrochemicals that don't move well in the plant are often not as effective as we need them to be. And that is the problem that Inplant is solving. Our problem echoes problems from drug delivery and our solution comes from that world too. Liposomes are tiny bubbles made of lipids that can be used to encapsulate different active ingredients as cargoes. The special properties of lipids are used in the pharmaceutical industry to improve the distribution of drugs in the human body. We use them to improve the distribution of agrochemicals in the plant. Now, despite the basic similarity, it really isn't trivial to take the technology from pharma and adapt it to agriculture. It's a different world. So the properties of the liposomes need to be tailored to work in plants. Also, as opposed to pharma, in agriculture, the costs have to be very low, and the relevant quantities are huge. Obviously, the conditions of storage and use are very different, and so are the regulatory challenges. In the past few months, we've begun to address several aspects of this challenge. We encapsulated different, uh, different cargoes, including our first commercial targets. And we showed liposomes move from the roots into cells in the leaves, and from the leaves into cells in the roots, with subsequent cargo release. Importantly, we are able to replicate these results with inexpensive raw materials, demonstrating the crucial economic feasibility. And we now have initial indications of improved efficacy with herbicides and micronutrients. So just as a taste, let's go back to the problem of iron immobility. 
Here we compared commercial and liposomal formulations of iron, which we applied on the lowest leaf of iron deficient tomato plants. The plants treated with implants formulation were bigger because liposomal iron actually made it out of the treated leaf. So by improving the mobility of agrochemicals, we are able to improve their efficiency, which may translate into both higher yields and use of smaller amounts of chemicals. And this we can do at reasonable and possibly in some cases also lower costs. The technology is relevant to many different products, some of the multi-billion dollar products in different segments of the market, pesticides, fertilizers, biostimulants. And we're already in real negotiations with potential partners from different segments. For a company this young, Implant has a rare team that combines all of the critical disciplines we need for success. We're motivated by the belief that Implant will make a real contribution towards higher yielding, greener farming. We'll be raising money in 2017, and I'll be happy to speak with you. Thank you again for that presentation. Uh, do you have an estimated uh, timeline to market? And if you do, what is that estimate? Once we start a full-fledged program to develop a fertilizer, we can be in the market in two years. With pesticides, the timeline is a lot longer. Thank you. Thank you. Eli Englard. I'm the founder and CEO of ATP Labs. Our mission at ATP Labs is to deliver the optimal cultivation practices and best agriculture know-how to every farmer in the world, in every farm size, in every crop. In the last 15 years, uh, I took part in inventing and delivering large-scale digital products at 8200 startups and in Microsoft. And in the online world where, where I come from, it is very clear to us how the best optimization and how the best digital services work. It doesn't matter if it's personalized ads on Facebook or crowdsource navigation. It's all based on integrating masses of user data and using this data for constantly uh, optimizing the service. Every user action contributes to that optimization. So some of the best digital companies in the world rely on this equation. Data, users equals data equals optimization. Uh, and I'm very uh, passionate about agriculture and farming, so I knew that our mission to analyze cultivation know-how and distribute it in masses also rely on this guiding principle. And let me explain why. First of all, uh, we have hundreds of millions of potential users in agriculture. Most of them are farmers in India and China. Farmers today have more digital touch points, specifically with mobile phones. And lastly, there is a critical mass of agriculture equipment that's already installed in millions of farms and generating data, but don't have any analytical capabilities. This is a huge opportunity for us to understand what farmers are doing. So we have a mantra in our company, and that is that today farmers operate at best at 1.0 environment. This means that they're not learning from the experience of other farmers. It's very difficult for them to predict the impact of their decisions on yield and quality. And they do very little learning from previous seasons on how to reduce risks uh, in the coming season. On the other hand, every decision that farmers make, uh, whether it's on irrigation, soil quality, pesticides, can be the difference between seven tons an acre or 12 tons an acre. So imagine we could integrate and join the data related to all these farmer actions and learn from it over time. Think about the impact this can have on the entire food system uh, with banks, insurance, Consumer goods manufacturers, they're all trying to find better ways to evaluate agriculture output from the bottom up. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. It's not an easy one, I should say, uh, but let me try to, to, to explain our approach to this uh, problem. 
we're building a software platform called GrowOS. The key differentiating factor of GrowOS comparing to all other market alternatives is that GrowOS integrates with existing agriculture equipment as opposed to replacing it. It integrates, it builds an analytical layer on top of traditional agriculture equipment in order to learn what farmers are doing. GrowOS is currently piloted in Israel. Uh, we're integrated with several sensing systems and irrigation systems. And uh, we're planning to conclude 10 pilots by the end of this year, and over time expand to the US, South America, and India, which is a strategic market for us. But the uniqueness of GrowOS is about building the agriculture data network as fast as possible. This is our key metric. And we are built for scale on the technological aspect as well as the business aspect. On the technological side, we have uh, patent pending technology on tackling some of the biggest challenges uh, with agriculture data, whether it's standardization, agriculture interoperability, and the ability to learn across farms, across geographies, across seasons. On the business aspect, instead of going farm to farm and installing expensive new equipment, we work with global manufacturers and distributors to deploy GrowOS as an add-on feature on top of their existing product range. Ultimately, GrowOS has multiple commercialization routes. Uh, the key beneficiary is the farmer, but there are other stakeholders who have interest in agriculture from the likes of Pepsi, McDonald, the World Bank, John Deere. I already told you about myself. Uh, we have a great team with highly relevant experience to bring online technologies and big data uh, specifically to agriculture. And we're embarking on this very exciting and revolutionary journey. I'd be happy to tell you more about our work and see if we can share value together. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, how are you going to get the farmers to cooperate and to share with you their most sensitive commercial data? Because eventually it's a chicken and egg kind of thing. You know, if you don't have their data, you can't analyze it, you can't give them benefits. And, but, you know, it's, if one shares the data with you, then his competitor will also know it. So, I mean, it's a bit of a can be a bit of an issue. Right, so uh, this is a very good question, but I think we've seen it in other industry, okay? There is this trade-off between the amount of optimization and value you get as a user and the data that you share. If we manage this trade-off uh, in the right way, and the right way is to build an awesome product, that is your answer. So we have to manage this trade-off. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Asaf. I am the CEO and co-founder of Enzutic. Enzutic is a biotechnological platform offering advanced solutions to the crustacean aquaculture industry. And I'm going to use most of the five minutes that I have today to tell you a little bit about our first product that we feel is very exciting. But some background first. In almost every livestock sector, there are clear economic and ethical advantages to producing and growing just one of the sexes. In some species, it may be due to production of eggs and milks by the females. In others, it may be due to the significant size differences or growth rates between the sexes. In any way, we believe that the future of all livestock agriculture is monosex population. Now, Enzutic is assuming a leading position in the crustacean aquaculture industry which is the fastest growing livestock sector in the world, with over 10% annual growth for the past decade and over $36 billion worth of value. Now, this industry is comprised mostly of four different groups, shrimp, crabs, crayfish, and prawns. And in most of the currently cultured crustacean species, females outperform the males dramatically. Therefore, Production of monosex and all-female population has been the holy grail of this industry for many, many years. Now, Enzutic has recently launched a proprietary biotechnological solution to this need, and here it is in a nutshell. So in crustaceans, males have two Z sex chromosomes, and females have one W chromosome and one Z chromosome. Crossing of this pair would generate a mixed population of males and females. Now, Enzutic's technology 
is the ability to produce a female that has two W chromosomes with no C. Crossing of this WW female with any given male would generate 100% all female culture. Now, to achieve these WW females, we don't use any type of hormones, we don't use any type of chemicals, and we don't use any type or any kind of genetic modifications. It is based on three decades of scientific know-how of our co-founder and CTO, Professor Amir Segui from Ben Gurion University. Now, Enzutic is the first in the world to offer this WW females commercially, and we have recently began the sales of these WW females to hatcheries worldwide. Now, this technology has another important advantage, which is line protection. And I'll try to use this diagram to explain it to you. This is the flow chart of the supply chain in the shrimp industry. On the left, there are a handful of multinational breeding companies that produce genetically bred elite lines. They capture today about 25% of the market. The remaining parts of the market is basically rebreeding down the stream in the supply chain. Now, using Enzutic's all-female technology would not only enhance the performance for the farmers, but would also reduce the incentive and ability of rebreeding in the supply chain. Therefore, we believe that this technology has the potential of transforming the shrimp industry from a shrimp to a seed-like industry by moving the balance of the supply chain towards the breeding companies. Now, the all-female technology is just one of the three biotechnological products and Zootic is currently developing. All three products are designed to improve profitability, yield, and sustainability. They are, each one of them, based on separate IP and business models, and they all avoid the use of chemicals, hormones, and GMO. The products are designed to be B2B products, and our potential customers are breeding companies, veterinary companies, feed companies, and hatcheries. And we are currently operating in Israel. We have two R&D sites here in Israel. We have a commercial arm in Hong Kong and a US business office. And we are currently raising additional capital to support our expansion efforts in Southeast Asia, which is by far the largest aquaculture industry in the world. If you have any more questions, I'll be happy to answer them during the break, and I want to thank you for your time. Thanks, Asaf. Uh, you said that your solution was, was different from genet genetic engineered solutions. Can you elaborate on this a bit? Because I assume it gives you, you know, relative benefit when it comes to offering your solution from a regulatory point of view and other aspects. Right. So, in a nutshell, the concept of the technology is called parental cell implantation. What we do is we implement, use cells from the parents and we implant them into offsprings to generate some kind of sex reversal, which eventually leads to the production of the WW females. This technology has been recently published in a peer-reviewed journal called Marine Biotechnology, and you're more than welcome to read about it. And it is covered by two layers of patents which cover this unique manipulation. But it's not in any kind, any type of transmissible genetic modification.